on World News Tonight. France unrest. The French Prime Minister Elizabeth Warren visits the protestation as the violence in France continues to its third day. Bailout. The IMF staff and the Pakistani authorities reach staff level agreement to really stall funds as the South Asian nation teeters on the brink of default. Cancer risk. Popular artificial sewing will use thousands of products worldwide, including Diet Coke, is to be declared a possible cancer risk to humans by the World Health Organization. You, me, and the balloons. A Japanese artist forms the centerpiece of Manchester International Festival featuring her favorite sculptures. This is Adaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. A good evening and you are watching World News Tonight and we start off with the escalating violence in France as public protesters sweep the streets of Paris. French Prime Minister Elizabeth Bourne visited the partially destroyed town hall in Gage-Legonnais, north of Paris, two days after a 17-year-old boy was shot in the chest at close range by police in Natere, a western suburb in Paris. Unrest erupted again on Thursday in France, marking the third day of clashes over the deadly police shooting of a teenager. In Nanterre, where the incident took place, cars were set on fire and protesters set up road barricades, hurling projectiles at lines of police. Riot police fired back with tear gas. Earlier in the day, there had been a largely peaceful march for the victim, identified as 17-year-old Niel of North African descent. He was shot dead during a traffic stop, and public anger over the incident led to riots across France this week. The teenager's mother chanted, Justice for Niel, with other supporters in the march. Karima Katem, a local councillor in blanc Mesnel, northeast of Paris, says people's patience is running thin. I think we owe this today to Niel. There have already been so many like him before, and we don't want any more. By killing Niel, they killed our child. Earlier, President Emmanuel Macron held a crisis meeting with senior ministers over the shooting and condemned the unrest. Interior Minister Gerald Darmanin said 40,000 police officers would be deployed across the country on Thursday. That's nearly four times the numbers mobilized the previous day. A video shared on social media shows two police officers beside a Mercedes AMG car with one shooting at the teenage driver at close range as he pulled away. He died shortly afterwards from his wounds. A non-terra prosecutor said the officer involved had been put under formal investigation for voluntary homicide. The officer has acknowledged firing a lethal shot, the prosecutors added, telling investigators he wanted to prevent a car chase after the teenager allegedly committed several traffic violations. The incident has fed long-standing complaints of police violence and systemic racism inside law enforcement agencies from rights groups and within the low-income, racially mixed suburbs across the country. Authorities deny the accusations. Crisis in Pakistan has reached a staff-level agreement with the International Monetary Fund over $3 billion of funding. The deal, which still needs to be approved by the Global Lenders Board, comes after an eight-month delay. The South Asian nation is facing its worst economic crisis since independence from Britain in 1947. To help secure the deal, Pakistan's central bank raised its main interest rate to a record high of 22% on Monday. Pakistan's economy, which is already struggling after years of financial mismanagement, has been pushed to the brink by a global energy crisis and devastating floods that hit the country last year. Once agreed at staff level, such deals were usually granted by the IMF's executive board. The board is expected to consider the agreement in the coming weeks. Pakistan's annual inflation rate hit a fresh record high in May of almost 38 percent. The $3 billion of funding, which will be spread over nine months, is higher than expected. Pakistan was awaiting the release of the remaining $2.5 billion from a $6.5 billion bailout package agreed in 2019, which expired on Friday. The nation of more than 230 million people has been struggling for years to stabilize its economy. This year, the country's foreign exchange reserves fell to a level that covered less than three weeks of imports. Deadly clashes between supporters 
members of Pakistan's former Prime Minister Imran Khan and police have also rattled financial markets. In May, Mr Khan was arrested on corruption charges in a move that has since been ruled as illegal by the country's Supreme Court. Over the last year, the Pakistan rupee has fallen by around 40% against the US dollar. Separately, donors from around the world have pledged more than $9 billion to help Pakistan recover from devastating floods that hit the country in 2022. It had been estimated that it needed more than $16 billion to recover from the disaster. Extreme weather is ravaging India where continuous high temperatures and heavy rain have exacerbated food production and shipment challenges, sending the price of vegetables and fruits skyrocketing. Since June, India has been suffering hot weather with temperatures exceeding 40 degrees Celsius in multiple areas. Waterlogging and flooding coupled with high temperature have reduced crop yields, while massive downpours have disrupted shipment as bridges were washed out and roads swamped by flood water, causing extreme difficulty for farmers to preserve perishable vegetables and fruits. As yields are reduced and food shipment gets more difficult, prices of common vegetables including spinach, cabbage and loofah have soared rapidly. The retail price of tomatoes, one of the most common food items in Indian households, have surged between 5 to 10 rupees per kilogram to 100 rupees per kilogram. According to the forecast of the Indian Meteorological Department, the monsoon will bring more rain to many states across India. With heavy downpours expected to lash more areas including the western, eastern and northeastern regions, prices of fruits and vegetables are likely to rise even higher. American advocacy group Anti-Defamation League has said that over half of Americans, sur Americans surveyed in the last year reported facing online harassment and hate during their lifetime, including more than 75% of transgender responders. Over half of Americans surveyed in the last year reported facing online hate in their lifetime. That's according to a new study by the Anti-Defamation League. The figure is a 12% jump from the advocacy group's same survey last year. ADL Vice President Yale Eisenstadt says the results are worrying. The survey also found that percentage rose to 76% for transgender responders, the highest of any group. Excluding trans people, the percentage of LGBTQ plus responders that reported online hate was 47 percent. The rate of harassment was 26 percent for Jewish respondents, 38 percent for black Americans, and 38 percent for Muslims. 2,139 adults and 550 teenagers were surveyed in all. House Bill 15 is now law in the state of Texas. In the past year, Republican-led states have signed a flurry of bills related to transgender youth. Some of those bills remain held up in court. On Wednesday, judges in Kentucky and Tennessee blocked state laws that banned puberty-blocking drugs and hormones for transgender children, while lawsuits challenging the bans proceed. Proponents say the bills protect minors, while opponents say they disenfranchise them. Eisenstadt says the wave of legislation has contributed to the rise in vitriol online. The online world feeds off of what is happening offline and vice versa. And so when you see an increase of hateful rhetoric, charged political speech, that obviously has an effect. But even more important, over the past year, we've seen most of these social media companies make dramatic cuts to their trust and safety teams, to the very people who job it is, is to make sure that people remain safe online, whose job it is to ensure that these companies are actually enforcing their anti-hate policies. So I think that's a major factor. And frankly, just year after year, if the numbers get worse, it is pretty clear that that means the companies are not taking these, these threats, these problems, these situations seriously enough. Eisenstadt says that while all platforms do poorly in protecting users from abuse, Facebook ranked the worst for the second consecutive year. But Twitter, Reddit, and YouTube all also saw an increase in online hate and harassment. One of the world's most common artificial sweeteners is set to be declared a possible carcinogen next month by a leading global health body, according to two sources with a knowledge of the process, pitting it against the food industry and regulators. It's used in everything from diet sodas to chewing gum. Now artificial sweetener aspartame could be labelled a possible cancer risk. The sources say the International Agency for Research on Cancer 
an arm of the World Health Organization, will make the move next month. It will list aspartame as possibly carcinogenic to humans. The ruling is based on all published evidence and is meant to spur more research into the product. It doesn't take into account how much a person can consume before facing a heightened risk. The news has drawn a furious response from drinks makers. The International Sweeteners Association said the IARC was acting on widely discredited research. Aspartame has been investigated for years. One French study showed slightly increased cancer risks in people who consumed a lot of the sweetener but the results have been disputed and the product remains widely used. It's in things including Diet Coke and Mars Extra Chewing Gum. The IARC is due to make public its decision on July 14th. Its past rulings have forced makers to change recipes and sparked waves of lawsuits. Critics say it's too prone to causing consumer alarm. The body has previously listed working overnight, eating red meat, and using mobile phones as possible cancer risks. We're going into a short commercial break now. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back. Christine King Ferris, the elder sister of the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., died Thursday, according to a Twitter post by her niece, Reverend Bernice King. She was 95, the King Center said in a news release announcing Ferris's death. Christine King Ferris, the sister of American civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr., died on Thursday. She was 95 and had been King's last living sibling. Ferris died peacefully in Atlanta, Georgia, with her family by her side. According to Atlanta's King Center for Nonviolent Social Change, a group she founded after the death of her brother. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated in 1968 by a segregationist. That was five years after he gave his famous I Have a Dream speech, calling for equal rights for black Americans and for an end to racism in the United States. And just like her brother, Ferris herself was a prominent activist. She took part in historic movements such as the 1965 march from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama, and the March Against Fear in Mississippi in 1966. In a statement of condolences, U.S. President Joe Biden said, Ferris stood for peace, freedom and justice. South Korea's southern region continues to see monsoon rain, which is likely to continue into the night and into early next morning in some parts. Meanwhile, the city of Yongju reports the death of a baby in a landslide. As South Korea is hit with days of rain, a baby was killed when her home was hit by a landslide in Yongju City, Gyeongsangbukdo province, on early Friday morning. The city saw more than 230 millimeters of rain through Thursday night and Friday morning, and the soils had already been weakened by days of rain previously. The other occupants of the home hit by the landslide, seven adults and two children, were able to escape. Gyeongsangbukdo province saw a total of 90 emergency calls for help, mainly in Yeongju City, and rescuers helped save a total of 21 people from danger. The rain is expected to continue through Friday in most parts of the country, with heavy rain concentrated in the southern region. As of 11 a.m. Friday, a heavy rain warning is in place for Jeollanamdo province, parts of Jeollabukdo, Gyeongsangbukdo, Gyeongsangnamdo provinces, and Jeju Island. The Korea Meteorological Administration has forecast heavy rain for Jeollanamdo and Gyeongsangnamdo provinces throughout Friday into early Saturday from 50 to 100 millimeters. Jeju is expected to see 100 to 200 millimeters of rain, along with thunder and strong winds continuing as late as early Saturday morning. The capital region is expected to see significantly less rain. While on Saturday, the country is expected to see some respite from the downpours, clouds are on their way from the south, and Jeju is expected to see monsoon rain again on Sunday. Thousands of flyers are stranded at airports across the United States ahead of the holiday weekend as many flights are being delayed or cancelled. Final approach to the holiday with thousands of flyers spending another day stuck, stranded and frustrated. Our flight was set to leave at 8 a.m. and it got cancelled hours before we were supposed to fly out. 
While most airlines have recovered from this week's weather-related meltdown, United Airlines is still struggling. On Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, it canceled a quarter to a third of its flights. United says ops are now improving, but still canceled 14% of flights today, with its key hubs hit hardest at Newark and Houston. We're just trying to get a flight into Vegas so we can get to see some shows. United blamed a shortage of air traffic controllers for its weekend problems, but then suffered its own operational meltdown. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg tweeting, with the exception of United, airlines have recovered to a more typical cancellation delay rate as of this morning. It does take a, a day or two for uh, the, the equipment and the staff to get back into position for where they need to be. Cranky Flyer blogger Brett Snyder says airlines are flying at full capacity. Meanwhile, the FAA is investigating another close call in Austin on Monday. An Allegiant airplane aborted its landing to avoid a small plane, the two coming within 1.6 miles of each other. The U.S. Supreme Court decided that colleges and universities can no longer take race into consideration when it comes to admissions. President Biden slammed the decision, calling the court not normal. The U.S. Supreme Court on Thursday ruled 6-3 that U.S. colleges and universities can no longer apply affirmative action as a specific basis for granting admission, meaning race can no longer be taken into consideration in tertiary level applications. The landmark decision reverses a decades-long precedent that benefited black and Latino students when entering higher education. According to Chief Justice John Roberts, Harvard and University of North Carolina admissions programs violated the Equal Protection Clause as they failed to give measurable objectives to justify the use of race in admissions. He added that affirmative action programs in the two schools unavoidably employ race in a negative manner, involve racial stereotyping, and lack meaningful endpoints. While the majority opinion by the U.S. Supreme Court does not formally overturn affirmative action in higher education, it will make it virtually impossible for colleges and universities to take race into account for admissions from now on. Meanwhile, President Joe Biden criticized the latest decision by the Supreme Court, saying the decision walked away from decades of precedent, adding he strongly disagreed with the decision. Today, the court once again walked away from decades of precedent, and make, as the dissent has made clear, the dissent states in today's decision, quote, rolls back decades of precedent and momentous progress, end of quote. I agree with that statement from the dissent. Despite the latest decision by the top court, Biden urged schools to continue considering racial adversity for applicants. He says discrimination still exists in America and that the Supreme Court ruling was a severe disappointment. The affirmative action ruling is the latest in recent reversals by the Supreme Court, including a ruling on abortion rights. Welcome back to World News Tonight, and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Former U.S. Vice President Mike Pence, who is running for the Republican nomination in the 2024 presidential election, made a surprise visit to Ukraine to meet President Vladimir Zelensky. Pence vowed to keep providing Ukraine with the support they need for the duration of the conflict. A smoky haze from ongoing Canadian wildfires blanketed Washington, D.C.'s iconic monuments for the second time this month. Air quality alerts in Washington were in the red zone, meaning unhealthy, according to the Environmental Protection Agency. At least three men, including a policeman, were killed in Manipur after gunfight erupted between security forces and armed miscreants who were attacking hill villages. China resolutely opposes U.S.-Taiwan military ties and urges the United States to stop selling weapons to Taiwan. Its foreign ministry said during a regular news briefing in Beijing. New Zealand coach said that the football firms would fight for their country at the Women's World Cup. They are co-hosting with Australia after naming her 23 women's squad for the tournament. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again on Monday for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we end tonight as a Japanese artist, Yayoi's Kasuma's inflatable large-scale sculptures are shown together for the first time in a new exhibition in Manchester, England. Stay safe and have a great weekend.